Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This year, we are starting the Bengal Club Dialogues, in which the club will present conversations with eminent personalities. For our inaugural session, we are delighted to present Mr. Veer Sangvi. Mr. Sangvi will be in conversation with Mr. Otri Bhattacharya. Mr. Sangvi is one of the best known Indian journalists of his generation. His career straddles print, television, books, and now new media. He became the youngest editor in the history of Indian journalism when he was appointed editor of Bombay Magazine at the age of 22. At 30, he became editor of Sunday Magazine of the ABP Group, which under his editorship became India's largest selling English language news magazine. In 1999, he was appointed editor of the Hindustan Times, the largest selling English language newspaper in Delhi and North India. Mr. Sangvi has also parallelly pursued a TV career which began when he was editor of Sunday. He has anchored several landmark TV programs, including Question Time for Doordarshan, Star Talk, and Cover Story. He is also one of the country's finest food critics, and in 2015, he co-founded Easy Diner, an online restaurant reservation service that has become the leader in its field. He has won several awards in his illustrious career, and it, it, it really is our privilege at the Bengal Club to have him as the inaugural guest for our Bengal Club Dialogue series. Mr. Bhattacharya is an IS officer who is currently Secretary, Departments of Water Resources and Information and Cultural Affairs, West Bengal. He is also one of the best known quizzers in India, a prolific writer, and a formidable force in all things concerning P.G. Woodhouse. Among the many interests that he shares with Mr. Sangvi, the primary ones would be his keen interest in food and cooking. We thank Mr. Bhattacharya for agreeing to be in conversation with Mr. Sangvi. I would now request Mr. Bhattacharya to take this evening forward, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all, I, as far as I could make out from my reading of, you know, this book has been my support, uh, and I recommend it. You read one? Yeah, I read it. you read all of it. Most of it. My honestly. sympathies are. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> so I just, I would just like to say that uh, everything he said about Mr. Sangvi is corroborated by the book. Unfortunately, a lot of uh, what he said about me is not quite up to date, but that doesn't matter because the star is here. And uh, so uh, this, when I first got a mail about the session, I I was told that we should talk about media and how um, you know old media is adjusting to uh, the internet and social media and so on and uh, I think as I was telling you it's summed up the, the what we face today is summed up by a line spoken by a character named Hathiram Chaudhary I don't know if you remember this is the character played by Inspector Hathiram Chaudhary the character played by Jaydeep Alawat in Patal Lok and brilliantly summed up in one line the dilemma of our times. He says, <laughs> So it's funny, but it's very, very sad. What would you say about that? I think it's, if you've been following the Bharat-India controversy, which has been raised either by the government or by people, associated with the government, possibly not by the government. The one thing that comes through very clearly is that almost all the points made by everybody come from WhatsApp forwards. There is no sense of history. There is no sense of truth. People just believe what they read on WhatsApp. So that's something else uh, that, you know, I, I, I will be <coughs> painful and quote you once in a while. So you've also written that... You're happy if you have, if you're read by people who can read without moving their lips. Yes. Which is where reading has gone these days. Is that what you're saying? That people I'm, don't read anymore? I'm saying people don't read. My own son doesn't read. His friends don't read. Nobody reads. And certainly if they read, they don't read books, which is the real tragedy. And yet, if you look at book sales on Kindle, etc., Book sales are not going down. Book sales are actually going up all over the world. Why is it that you and I never meet people who read these books? I do, unfortunately. I meet people who've read books I haven't read. 
No, I meet people who read WhatsApp and it's because I move in journalistic circles and you move in high highfalutin civil service circles. <laughs> it's a misconception that civil service circles are highfalutin, but you know that, but seriously, when you yes. say that uh, book sales are going up, yeah. uh, whether in, you know, in paper or on, are you saying that they're all like Anil Kapoor's library? I think Anil Kapoor's library is a reference for people who haven't got it to the claim, not substantiated, I hasten to add, that Anil Kapoor's library has many, many books. But if you were to push the wall, you would find it's just the spines, that there's actually a door and there are no books, right? It's, I think that is, that is what the claim is. I mean, I know Anil Kapoor, he's a friend of mine, and I don't think he's read a book, at least that I have read. So I don't think he would mind admitting this at all. But yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm always mystified. Is there a new generation, a new demographic shift, people who are buying books? Because I find bookshops are closing down. So it's possible people are buying these books on the net, on Kindle. I do most of my reading on Kindle. Publishers seem very happy. But if you, let's, we'll, we'll go back to the Bharat-India controversy. The most common WhatsApp forward is that until the British got here, our country was called Bharat. Then the British gave us the name India, and these Congress people who are, you know, stooges of the British want therefore to call it India. Now, this is not true in on so many different levels. The name India is very, very old. It comes from the same root. The people of our country were called after the river Sindhu, which was the name they gave to the Indus. And you get from that same root India, and you get Hindu. So if you're going to make fun of that root and say, why should we care, then we'll say bye-bye to Hindutva also, because it's exactly the same root. And that name has been in existence, what? It's in Ptolemy's map. When Alexander came to India to invade us, he didn't say, I'm off to Bharat. He said, I'm off to India. So it's an ancient, ancient name, which is not to say that Bharat is not an ancient name. It appears in many texts. But there are not that many texts that refer to Bharat as clearly being the name of India. Just as if you will look into the Vedas and all of that, nowhere is the word Hindu appearing. Yeah, so these are things that are complicated. They're not things you can do lying WhatsApp forwards about. It's like this claim that Bharat is BJP and India is Congress. Okay, what was the Bharat Jodo Yatra then? Was it Mr. Modi? What is make in India? Was that Rahul Gandhi? No, that was Mr. Modi. So yes, there are arguments on every side. The world is complicated. And yet, what we try and do these days, particularly with social media, with things like WhatsApp, is to reduce it to yes, no, to black, white. And we do that by lying. Does that answer your question? It just raises more questions. All right, go ahead. Which is a good. Now, I'll just step back from the entire Bharat versus India thing because I'm still in service and I'd like to remain in service. So. Yeah. You can ask the questions, I'll say the outrageous exactly. things. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when you come to this is how it was. Yeah. Anybody, I personally have a. I'm usually suspicious of anybody who is very certain of themselves that this is right, this is right, this is wrong, this yeah. is true, this is not. We don't know. Yeah. You and I were not here in 326 BC. Well, so, which, not that I remember. Sir. Yeah. <laughs> I might look that way, but believe me, I wasn't. So, don't you think that the essential problem right now is one of belief and not belief in, the, in, in this angst-ridden uh, Catholic poets of the early 20th century, but what to believe, whom to believe. I have a friend sitting in the front row. If I tell him, you know, if, if I say right now, I have two friends in the front row who know everything about everything. Okay. So if I tell them that it started from the Sindhu, yeah. they will trot out some other... Uh, they might, they might conceivably uh, cite P.S. Oak. You know who P.S. Oak is, right? I think he's the man who invented the spelling of historian, which had inverted commas at the beginning and the end. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Yeah. P.S. Oak, strangely enough, was a man uh, from UP who in 1932 wrote uh, um, a pamphlet about Tejo Mahalaya. Yeah. 
You know where that, that, where that went, right? Yes. It was P and O. Can you I remember? told you they know everything about it everything. Was, Actually, you're right. It was P.N. Oak. He was a Maharashtrian and he founded the Society for Rewriting Indian History. Yeah. Yes. So there, there you are. So, so the point is... So we have you, something in common then. Yeah. <laughs> and he's, he's one of the two people I told you about. Okay. okay. So, so the thing is, once this gains enough currency, you have a system of uh, circular references. It, it's, it's very incestuous. Somebody yeah. cites, Oak said that, and then the second person is cited and so on. You end up not knowing what is true. Yeah. But, but that is the classic idea of all totalitarian governments. It's all well, no? Wrong is right, right is wrong, truth is false. The idea is you make everything so murky, and it's been done not just in India. Trump did that. There were facts and there were alternate facts. How many people attended his inauguration? Well, the photographs show it was half empty. No, he said, there's an alternative view. It was full. So we now live in a society where truth is a matter of opinion. But hasn't it always been so? No. I think there were some objective truths which we believed in. If you said that the Indian mutiny began in 1857, it began in 1857. If you said India became independent in 1947, it, be it became. It's no longer true. You will have people saying on Twitter that India became independent in 2014 when Mr. Modi was elected. Oh dear. I'm staying away from that at this moment. You know, you keep going close to this, you can't blame me. <laughs> no, but... Oh, yes, uh, 1947, Indian independence, etc., is a documented fact. But when you say the first Indian War of Independence was 1857, there are people who will dispute that because there were tribal uprisings, there were local uprisings before 1857. So, you know, maybe that was the first well-coordinated one, but there were regional uprisings before that. Yeah, that's if you use the term War of Independence. If you use the term Sepoy Mutiny, then there isn't a problem. Because that was the first national Sepoy Mutiny. If you use the term War of Independence, how do you, how do you accommodate the fact that, they wanted to, that most of them wanted to put Bahadur Shah Zafar back on the throne? Independence from what? Independence from whom? Independence from the British, from the East India Company. But it wasn't just the British all over the country, you know. Yes, is, but, the, but the revolt was on the whole against the British and against the yeah. people who supported the British, surely. True, and but to go to a you know, since I am you know born and bred in Bengal, you will allow me a slightly Marxist or at least leftist interpretation. I think the first, most of all, it was a revolt against hunger. It was a revolt by people, even the sepoy. So I read this uh, brilliant book recently called I don't know if it's uh, Murder at the Mushaira by Raza Mir. This I is a, a management professor who's uh, written a biography of Ghalib. And I highly recommend this book because Mirza Ghalib is, a, is an amateur detective there. Anyway, so the thing is that he says the war of Indian independence was spurred not the, you know, this whole thing about re revolting against the British. It was not so much against the British as against their taxes. You had poor people and poor people, farmers who had uh, family in the British forces, hence the mutiny who couldn't get enough to eat because the British took away everything they earned. So it was driven by hunger. It was not driven by um, prestige. It was not driven uh, by uh, uh, any, uh, any very great liberal idea. It was driven by sheer hunger. We've got to get rid of these people if we want to have enough to eat. It was still a war against the British, no? Whether it was because for liberal reasons yeah. or because they were taking away money. And against, and against it. So to that extent, yeah. yes, I, I agree. But, you know, the, to come back, because I would have a brief, and you know, if, uh, if I'm, I'm not even a member of this club, I'd dearly love to be allowed back again. So uh, I should stick to some extent to the brief that we have been okay. given. All right. So when you talk about... You've already sort of used a Marxist parallel, which I'm sure your chief minister will love, so keep going. Um, you're a little out of date. The last <laughs> Marxist chief minister was about 11, 12 years ago. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I was being ironic. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, so anyway, uh, we, we were talking about media. Now, yeah. the question is, um, I think it's a question of relevance. To begin with, to begin with, we were just discussing with Mala, we have, I have a friend who pointed out that what we say here or what we discuss has very little relevance because we are two products of privilege. You know, we live our own, own cocoon. We are sitting in one of the most exclusive institutions in this country. 
and we're talking in English about how media is relevant. What media? Who reads it? You do know that uh, you know, the, the, the largest circulated paper in this uh, country is not in English. The second largest is not. That's, that's the Times of India you're referring to? No. Okay, all right. So uh, I, it, it's changed I'm a sorry, lot. you had me confused. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. brand, brand loyalty, brand right. loyalty. Okay, all right. <laughs> no, but you see, nine out of the ten largest circulated print newspapers in this country are not in English. Five are in Hindi, two are in Malayalam, one I think is in Telugu, in Aru. So we are here talking essentially about the reach of mainstream English media. Uh, or That was our brief. And I'll just say that from our background, and from a, it's all of crashing irrelevance. But, I mean, who started talking about English media? You the did. Big old I'm talking about media being replaced by social media, and that's an all-India phenomenon. You, because you're in the Bengal club, think of it only in terms of English media. I do too. Also because I got the email in English. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, now, uh, you, you have yeah. been, as was pointed, you were one of the young, you were the youngest editor in, in India of an English paper. Yeah. And you went on to edit more. Yeah. But uh, it, this is something I really want to ask you, and not, this is not a... So, doesn't every print publication, or other public, any, any media, doesn't have a natural life cycle? So, when you say that print media is dying out, so, isn't that a phenomenon common through time, which applies to practically everything except the Bombay Samachar. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have no problem with that. Okay. I think all media changes, but if you write an article and the person who reads it reads it on print, or he reads it on his telephone, or he reads it on his iPad, he's still reading your article. The right. actual medium doesn't matter that much. But the number of such people is going down, as you say, because they're mostly reading WhatsApp forwards. No, I'm, I'm not saying that. I don't know if there are any absolute numbers. I'm saying that public discourse is being determined more and more by social media. It could be that the people who are taking part in discourse, which to a large extent is also conducted on social media, are by definition social media fans. And people who read more serious stuff don't necessarily come out and argue. Now, I have a different take on that because, you see, social media, what we call social media, is a technological phenomenon. It is what we call, it is the present form of the grapevine. Of the, the grapevine? grapevine? The grapevine. The grapevine has always existed. Earlier, you know, you might have had people sending chapatis or people, you know, sitting at Chayakanukkar or in the Wild West, people exchanging information in saloons. Now you have the internet and you have smartphones, so it's easier. But this form of media, this form of exchanging news and information has always existed. <laughs> and despite that, despite that, 2023 July figures say that 39.8% of India's population still read newspapers, which, is, which I find amazing. Yeah. None of that contradicts anything I've said. No, so so your sense, point is... No, no, in the sense that you, you did say that more and more people are turning to social media, yes. whereas uh, possibly, you know, uh, the figures suggest that they have not yet turned away from mainstream uh, media to social... Yeah, no, no, I, I have no problems with that. If people didn't read mainstream media, I'd be unemployed today. So yes, people do read mainstream media. All I'm saying is that the grapevine, which is a very good example, is essentially the equivalent of a gossip column. Yeah, so when you see things in gossip columns, you wait for official verification in something that's reliable, where there's some amount of editing or fact-checking. I am only saying that the grapevine has now become the message and the medium because there's less and less interest in fact-checking. People are happy to see a tweet and imagine it's true. Right, but uh, do you, so you, uh, would you say, are you saying that? Yeah. Uh, fake news, to use the common term, that uh, is more common now and more common on social media than it used to be? Yes. I think all, that's the one thing almost everybody agrees on. If you listen to Mr. Trump, or ex-president, ex -president, future President Trump, 
He complains about fake news. If you listen to liberals, they complain about fake news. If you listen to Mr. Modi, he complains about fake news. The government has set up an official PIB fact-checking site that tells you things on Twitter or whatever because he believes there's too much fake news. And I believe there's a lot of fake news. Don't you? I believe, as I said at the beginning, I don't know what to believe. That's exactly my point. Yeah. It's very hard to identify the truth. It's become a matter of opinion. No, I'll tell you, I'll tell you where I'm coming from. What I'm saying is that the growth of technology has accelerated and multiplied a phenomenon that has existed throughout human civilization. Yeah, I have no problem with that. But when we talk about fake news, you're tr treating it as though I'm talking only about Twitter. I'm not. No, no, no. If you were to turn on to television, yeah. which is old technology, it's not some great new technology, there are as many lies being told on television as there are on Twitter. It's just our standards have changed. Yes, but um, you know, especially in my job, I've found that people are not open to any fact, any argument, or even fact that contradicts their beliefs. And this is a situation which has been true for several thousands of years. It's very rarely, you know, it takes, it takes a movement, it takes a messiah, local, or, you know, to change people's views about the world. People and yet, just, presumably, these messiahs have succeeded because we've progressed. No, we're not still living in caves, so, so it happens. Yeah, so progress happens, but all, what I'm saying is this, this whole thing, this whole uh, thing about fake news, etc. yes, it's disturbing. What is disturbing to me is when people left, right, whatever they call themselves, they shout at each other instead of talking. And, you know, it's, the, as you said, very divisive, very divisive on both sides. You're not prepared to listen to the other person, which actually attacks one of the basic foundations of civilization. Yeah. If you're not, so yes, I, I, I'm very deeply saddened with you that this has increased, but the basic phenomenon that people will propound their views rather than listen to what you have to say, would you not say that it's yeah, common I think, to humans? I think, I think that's a human characteristic that's as old as humanity, but there's often been or usually been enough to counteract it, there isn't. There's also, as you correctly said, no room for complexity in this society. Everything is polarized. It's black and white. It's either this or that. Intelligence is defined as the ability to keep two opposing thoughts in your mind at the same time and still function. We are no longer interested in that. We just want one thought. And therefore, there used to be certain belief systems we shared. Those belief systems, I think, are now in danger. I'll give you an example. Arch Thak which is our leading television channel in Hindi, recently did a debate, Godse or Gandhi, who was right? Can you imagine a situation where this mainstream media, Godse was put on par with the father of the nation? Yet, it happens because the belief systems we shared at one stage are now in danger. Yes, I'd say that coming from where we are, our generation, having grown up the way we have, yes, it's shocking. At the same time, yeah. if, if you put aside your beliefs or your value system for a bit, is it not true to say that the, the fact that that program could be telecast says something about free speech in the country? Yeah, I don't think free speech is the issue. There's a lot to say about free speech, Though that's not particularly one. If you did Modi or Hitler, which one was better, you'd learn a lot about free speech in no time at all. So, so I don't think it's a free speech issue. It's an issue of belief systems. That once upon a time, this would have been a non-issue, this question. It isn't a non-issue any longer. The head of the BJP's IT cell, the guy who does all those abusive troll tweets and all that, started three, four years ago sending out on tweets, go to say speeches, saying you can make up your own mind. Now, on the one hand, you have this happening. On the other hand, you have the prime minister taking G20 leaders to Rajpath and talking about Gandhiji's contribution to the world. So it's not very clear what our belief systems are. They seem endangered. They seem confused. 
But would you, you know, just to step back for a bit, I understand what you're saying, but I would say, you know, you can't, you, you can't judge or identify belief systems from what people say in politics, because in a democracy, per se, you have to reach out to the largest number of people in an, in, when you have, live in an electoral democracy. So you have to be a little ambiguous. You have to accommodate uh, both sides of the spectrum, if possible. Step back, step back. Uh, and we are not looking at politics uh, right here, because politics, frankly, you know, uh, politics is a very changeable thing. Uh, a, a person's politics can be very changeable. A person's views can be changeable. A person can be in politics with no ideology. That's also possible. So step back. Let's look at the common man. Let's look at people who are not engaged in active politics. Where do you see them in this morass? Who is the common man? If it's Common I, man is I, defined as a person. You said, let's talk about the common man yeah, okay. and then defined him or her, I should say, as people not engaged in active politics. In yes, this, for, in this context. That's, that's, in this this context. Whole, that's this whole room. They're not engaged in active politics. I haven't examined the entire room, but I, I, I presume that applies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so somebody who's not so engaged all, in So all of us politics. are really, in your definition, common people, no? In this context, yes. by this parameter. Yeah, so how does this, 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 this uh, on the one hand, this very, um, what shall I say, certainty, this being assured of certain certainties, and at the same time, not knowing what to believe. How do, how do we put it together? I think it's difficult for people. I think when all of us grew up, we had certain assumptions about the kind of country we lived in. We believed at the simplest level that assassins were a bad thing. We never believed we would live in a country where assassins and their victims, particularly the father of the nation, would be put on par. We lived in a country where we believed that even if the guy next to you said something you violently disagreed with, you equally violently defended his right to say it because we were a liberal democracy. You lived in a, you, we grew up in a country where we believed that though we were Hindus, and we believe, or at least I believe, that Hinduism is the world's greatest religion, that didn't give us the right to judge somebody else's religion or to interfere in the way in which he followed his faith. It didn't give us the right to say that only Hindus are true citizens of this country, everybody else is an interloper. Those certainties are now being questioned, and I think that's confusing, and that's dangerous going ahead. So, just, uh, you know, you have been a force because of your profession. You have been a keen observer of public life for several decades. How have you seen this change? How would you compare uh, the situation today with the situation with when you entered journalism uh, with the, back in the 80s? Well, it's very difficult to say because to come back to your definition of the common man, almost all of the things we talk and we say, you know, we're the Bengal Club, as you said, the most exclusive institution in the country, et cetera. Yes, that's true. There's a world outside the Bengal Club. And yet the world, what experience we have of it, what we see on social media, what we see on shouting matches on television, is essentially the world of the middle class. It's very hard for us to find out with somebody who's a working class guy who works in a factory, somebody who's a peasant in a rural area thinks. What we are seeing really are changes in the middle class. And these changes are more significant than they would have been at the time when I joined journalism. Because in those days, the middle class was small and had been brought up to share certain values. What you have post-1991 and post the prosperity of those reforms is a huge expansion of the middle class. And within that expansion of the middle class, you have people who don't necessarily share those values. And these are the people I think many political parties are appealing to. Now, will these people continue to share these views? Will their children share these views? I don't know. But ultimately, it's the answers to those questions that will determine the future of India. I guess, yeah, the, what you're talking about, as I understand it, is a fundamental change in the value system. Of the middle class. Only the middle class. Yeah, because I have no experience. I mean, how many 
industrial workers do you interrogate on a regular basis? How many peasants do we talk to? Not Almost anymore. everything in our world, whether you want to call it snobbishly lower middle class or whatever, is middle class. And the middle class now is about five times the size it was when I became a journalist. Many of the people in the middle class now are first generation middle class people. Their fab fathers were, had their prosperity increase because of the 1991 reforms. They've come into more money. Now, will they, as they get used to this, as they realize what it means to run a country, change their views? We don't know. But we are, at, as a country, because of a demographic dividend, which is what, 60% of our population is under 35 or more, that so many more people have joined the middle classes recently because of economic changes and prosperity brought by liberalization. India is going through a transitional phase. It's not the country it was in the 20th century. What kind of country will it be in the 21st century? It's too early to say. Okay, so that takes away my next question, which I was about to say, ask you, you know, whether this, uh, you know, this growth of the middle class, this uh, prosperity, this uh, ascent from abject poverty, so, on the whole, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, you say it's too early to say. No, the ascent from poverty is always a good thing. It's always a good thing when there's more prosperity in society. That I do not dispute. But prosperity and sudden prosperity always brings with itself changes in society. And we're in the midst of those changes now. And it's too early to say whether it's decadence. Too early to say whether? Whether it's decadence. No, it's like Oscar Wilde. America is the only society that went from barbarism to decadence without the intervening stage of civilization. No, I'm not saying that. I'm that, not saying that. That was my late father's view of me. <laughs> but, so, you know, I, when you, when you uh, what I really am curious about, so in, in this book, for example, you've mentioned that a person who charmed you a great deal when you spent two or three days with him, Amitabh Bachchan, yeah. you have uh, clearly pointed out, and uh, at this example of how, over the Bofors case, he was pilloried, he was pilloried by the press without their going into the facts. And that he was so, you know, and that, that was what, 40 years ago? So, what you point out as changes in the present day, they were true even back then? If your point is that the media would sensationalize things, if there was a name that sold newspapers, they would believe the worst in the hope of selling more newspapers, yes. I think that's always been true. But the media's coverage of a scandal, which may not have changed so much, is slightly different from a mass change in society, which is what I was talking about. Uh, do you, you personally do not subscribe to the view that the media is basically a platform for advertisements because that, that's what bring, brings in the revenue? That's a complicated question. I mean, for those of you who don't understand the mechanics of the newspaper business, which I imagine most of us, if you say, if a newspaper, say, costs you four rupees, the actual cost of producing that newspaper is ten rupees. The other six rupees are made up with advertising. This use this is true all over the world. It's not true on the internet, so that's a different case. So therefore, traditionally, the media, newspaper, shall we say, or television, have taken ads to make up the difference. There have been different attitudes to the advertiser. In India, we talked about the Times of India, when Samir Jain took over the Times of India, he argued that because the advertiser was so important. Ultimately, the newspaper should serve the interests of the advertiser. His brother, Vineet Jain, interviewed by the New Yorker, said, I've thought a lot about this. Are we in the news business? No, we're not. We're in the advertising business. Now, I think most Calcutta business groups would not take that. I don't think anybody at APP would say they were in the advertising business. At the Hindustan Times, we never said that. But there are different perspectives. And yes, I suppose it's a valid perspective to say that if we make our profits from the advertiser, he's our real client, not the newspaper, not the guy who buys the newspaper. Right. So, 
two, two related things. <coughs> One is, so something you said earlier that sensationalizing is always interesting in sales. So tell me frankly, when in your column you refer to the sitting prime minister of India as a small time manipulator, or you know, uh, you, you refer to a very prominent politician as a nutcase, the nutcase. Uh, Which so, one? I called so many of them nutcases. Which one is this? No, no, you've called them uh, other nastier names. This was somebody from Who? Bengal. You can say. Probably Let dead, it, it doesn't matter, yeah? This, this, is, this, is, this is when you were writing about uh, Ratan Tata uh, launching the nano, so you can f uh, figure I out. I never called it. Ratan Tata a nutcase. No, no, you didn't call, you huh. called a politician a nutcase. <laughs> Who? Work it <laughs> out. How do you really remember? <laughs> But listen, so, so a lot of is, listen. I met a lot of politicians in my time, and a lot of them are not cases. There's no getting around it. And I think somebody should tell the truth. No, no. I think he's alluding to our serving people. Which is why he's so. Who, Mamata? Yeah. I never called her a nut case. Did I call her a nut case? Yes. I you don't. Did. I haven't met her since she became your you, you serving did. chief minister. What I have said is that I have known her for many, many years. I was a great believer in her when she was opposing the CM. I was in Calcutta when she was beaten up by the police. I've seen photographs of the police with sticks hitting her on the head. She then wandered around with bandages. She went in and out of hospital. She used to come to our offices at ABP, bandaged, etc. And I had enormous admiration for her bravery, which I still do, because it was physical bravery. I had enormous admiration for her when she left the Congress against Narasimha Rao and set up on her own. She's a very brave person. I have never disputed that. I also think that many of her decisions are not clearly rational, and I have difficulty understanding them. Is that clear? That's, no, <laughs> so, no, no. That, that's not, that was my question. Yeah. I was saying that when you write these things in print, yeah. uh, is it A, a determination to say exactly what you feel, or B, uh, could be a bit of both, to be a little provocative so that people read more of your writing. That hasn't worked in that case because nobody's read more of my writing. Oh, <laughs> but, no, no, I don't want to be provocative. The statement about Narasimha Rao that you're referring to was I said, and it was in a column, it wasn't a headline or anything, I said that the key to understanding Narasimha Rao is that essentially he's a small-time manipulator who masquerades as a statesman. And then I went on to explain that ultimately what seemed like statesmanlike decisions, etc., were usually meant to cover up that Chandraswamy had got money from somebody to do it or whatever. And so I was making a commentary on the way India was being run. I don't think I ever called Mamta a nutcase, but we would all love it in this room if you read out that bit. <laughs> and. Uh, so, no, but was it you who termed uh, that phrase about Narasimha Rao, that uh, policy of masterly inaction? No, I think that was Narasimha Rao's own phrase. He, <laughs> I think Narasimha Rao also said about it, not taking a decision is a decision in, himself, in itself. All I said about him was that the man speaks nine languages and can't make up his mind in any of them. That's just true. <laughs> <laughs> so, but... He must have been one of the few politicians whom you didn't quite get quite uh, chummy with. because On the contrary, he is actually, though I was very critical of him, particularly in his down period and the brief period when he was out of power and uh, still alive, because he died soon afterwards, he would call all the time and I'd go and see him. Okay. So, but not when he was in power? Well, no, I met him quite often when he was in power. Okay. But Given that I was calling him a small-time manipulator, I don't suppose we were great chums. <laughs> no, but this is another question that uh, occurs to me. You, 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 my, a friend of mine who worked with you uh, some time back, he said that you are possibly the most, one of the most astute political analysts he's ever worked with. And uh, That's actually not true. Huh? I get every election wrong. I cannot predict anything. They, I, they used to stay in Calcutta. That if you want to know who's going to win an election, Go and ask Veer Sangvi, go and ask Kavik Sarkar. Whatever they say, believe the opposite. And it's been true. <laughs> no, 
But, but my question is that when you are a journalist and you know uh, you you value your objectivity, uh, is it is it not a little dangerous to get charmed by to get close to the the objects of your scrutiny? And in fact, on more than one occasion, whether it's Amitabh Bachchan or Ratan Tata or uh, Manmohan Singh, too, you get quite charmed by them. How does it affect your objectivity? I think the trick, if you're a journalist, is because you get your information from people, is to always have relationships with people where they give you information or you have an inside track and still manage to write about them objectively. Narasimha Rao is one example of a chap who I was quite critical of, yet who would call me all the time. Among the other people I found particularly charming was, say, Bal Thakare, who I would oppose all the time. I actually liked him enormously as a person. I'd go over for dinner, I'd go over for a drink. He would see me to my car. He was a very polite, old world gentleman. As we reached the car and I opened the door, he would put his feet together and shout, Jai Maharashtra. And I would put my feet together and shout, Jai Gujarat, because I, I didn't see. And he took it. He had no problem with that. So many of these people, you're scared of what you think they are. When you do it, they're not they're not really the ogres at a personal level. I wouldn't want to be caught in a riot created by the Shiv Sena, but at a, at a personal level, Mr. Modi, who people are so frightened of, he has been on my television show before he became Prime Minister, charming, laughing, self-deprecating. So politicians at a personal level are often very different. The trick is that you're not fooled by how charming they're at a personal level and mistake that for what they're like in politics. And uh, you'd say that holds true for not just politicians, but all public figures. For all human beings, yeah. I'm sure the fact that you're charming doesn't mean you're not a bad guy. <laughs> well, thank you for the fake compliment. I'll take it for the time being. <laughs> but, so, and you, and at, at no point of time has that interfered with your objectivity. I'm sure it has. I mean, nobody is perfect. I can't say that. I often maybe think better of people I know, but I'll give you examples. Rahul Gandhi, I used to know during his last, during the UPA second term is when I got to know him. I knew him a bit during the NDA's first term, and we were friendly. We called each other by first names. He would phone me, but I thought he was a disaster going into the last election. I thought he behaved disgracefully by resigning as Congress president and yet continuing to call the shots and not letting anybody else take over as Congress president. I believed he created, therefore, the impression in the minds of people that the opposition was not capable of running the country and strengthened the government and therefore failed the opposition. I've said this in print on numerous occasions. We don't necessarily meet each other very much, but no, the fact that he's a fun guy to sit and have a coffee with didn't make a difference. Fantastic. So we, we, I, I would find that difficult for, uh, you know, I share with a friend who's in this room, I, I, I share the inability, for example, sometimes asked to write a book review. To my advice is, I don't know if you've ever done it, do not ever review a book written by a friend. <laughs> you, will, you will lose either your objectivity or your friend. So, yes, that happens, <clears throat> but um, so when we, so who, who, and this is a very personal question, you will pardon me, but you know, somebody is upset. If you had to pick two or three people whom you have seen at close quarters over the last 40 years, who would you say are the most, two or three most impressive people that you have met? Take your time. Hard one, hard one to answer. Uh, Amitabh Bachchan, certainly one of the most impressive people I've met. Very few people have reached where he has, have been through what he's been through, and have emerged. He's been down more times than anybody I know. He's always come back. He's been written off more times than anyone I know. He's a man with no privacy, who can't go anywhere without people approaching him. He's a man, and I've seen him in crowded situations, 
I've seen him never refuse to be photographed, never refuse to give an autograph. I was once in London for the launch of Star TV in London with him. And there was a so-called exclusive dinner organized by Star TV for NRIs. And of course, like all Indians, they forgot the so-called exclusive element and they mobbed him and he could barely move. And I remember I was next to him and I said, Amit, this is okay. Do you mind that there's all this hassle? He said, yeah, if there wasn't this attention, I'd be worried. So as there's, I thought, a certain honesty to him. There was a lot to learn. He'd embraced his fame. It, did, it made a lot of difficult, things difficult for him. It made his life controversial. It made his personal life very controversial. But he learned how to handle it. He is the most famous Indian in the world, I think, without a doubt. And in terms of movie stars, if you just count the number of Indians there are in the world and people who see Hindi films, Amit and Shah Rukh Khan are probably the two most famous people in the world. Yet, they've both handled it. On a separate note, though, I wouldn't put him in the three because I don't know him that well. I've always been enormously impressed by Shah Rukh Khan. People say about Tony Blair that he's never met a single person he couldn't charm, which in fact is true. I find the same is true of Shah Rukh. There's such intelligence, such intensity, such perception that he always charms you on a one-on-one -on -one level. No matter what they throw at him, and God knows they've thrown so much shit at him over the last few years, he bounces back. It's Anybody who's been to the cinema of the last, over the last two days will tell you. But I mean, so in the film world, yeah, Amit and Shah Rukh. In the political world, yeah, but it's not a good example. Madhav Rao Sindhya was a friend of mine. I found him an incredibly impressive person because he'd been, what, a Maharaja? The so-called ruling Maharajas. He was still a Maharaja when the titles were abolished. He'd seen that world. And he completely abandoned it, and yet realized that in Gwalior, where he comes from, there was a world where, that he couldn't abandon. So if he went to the palace, people would call him Your Highness or whatever. And for him to say, don't be silly, don't call him your, me Your Highness, would be to deny centuries of history. So he was polite and he took that. But when you saw him in Delhi, people called him by his first name, people made fun of him. His friends all called him Bhaiya, and he said, do not call me Bhaiya. Bhaiya means milkman. So I said, we'll call you Maharaj because that means cook. So he, was, he would laugh at these jokes. He would laugh at himself. And to have seen so much privilege, to have seen so much wealth, to have seen political success, political power. He was incredibly popular in his constituency. People would go mad for him. And yet, to be completely normal, to keep his head straight, I thought was a huge, huge achievement. So that's two. I have to find. Okay, Shahrukh Khan, okay, right? three. That's okay. Shahrukh, I meant like half, I, because I don't want to include. I didn't want to include two, two and films half anymore. People. Didn't you, want to include. You never met. Yeah, Manmohan Singh in the first phase. I thought Manmohan Singh, when he became prime minister, I found a particularly impressive person. I had known him for a very long time before that. He was a man with great intellect, very brilliant, very modest. Very shrewd, though people didn't see that. Very modest and completely willing to explain things. I remember I went to see him when he was prime minister at Racecourse Road, and he talked about the US subprime crisis. Now, I'm financially illiterate, so I said, what is the subprime crisis? And like a Don giving a tutorial to a slightly backward student, he sat for 20 minutes and he explained it to me. It was just so much humility and no arrogance about him, even when he was prime minister. There was a flip side to it, and the flip side was that he froze when there was a problem, and towards the end of UPA 2, when he found that things were not working, that he had lost control over his the image and the image of his government, he was paralyzed with fear, and he sat in race course road, gave us no leadership, and ultimately allowed the BJP in. So yes, he had his faults, but initially as a man of such huge intellect, a man who came from such a poor family that there was you know, all those cliches about having to read textbooks by slam posts, etc., having to walk six miles to school, all of those were true in Manmohan Singh's case. He got to the top job and he never ever had any arrogance about it, never claimed he was self-made, never claimed he'd come through such difficult circumstances. So yes, 
Manmohan Singh phase one, I'm very impressed by. So the common thread running through all these is humility. That's what you really admire. Yeah, because we're talking about powerful and famous people, 99% of whom are not modest or humble, right? So you haven't met any very impressive people who are not famous. Any what? Very impressive people who are not famous. I have, but they'll be bored here if I tell them Why about not? my friends. It's, it's you. If you, if you, if you no, tell the story, no, they I mean, wouldn't be bored. I mean, I've been very impressed by many of my friends. But you're asking about people from the book. So I'm no, thinking, no, no. I didn't mention that. Anyway, but, whatever. Yeah. Thank you for that. But uh, uh, talking about you know, somebody giving up royalty, did you ever meet Jigme Singhye Wangchuk? I mean, I, I, that would be the ultimate. You know, I, I Sorry, which one is that? The father or the, the son? The father, the one no, who I, gave I know, up. I know the son, I don't know the father. No, it's because the father, I briefly met the gentleman. He, he came to Calcutta, he wanted to find a place to play basketball. Uh, this is back in 1992. And, you know, it has struck me that this is the only example I know in recorded history of a king who wanted to give up the throne and bring in an elected, elective democracy. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that is quite incredible. Yes, I agree. And I, I know the son a little, and he's also an incredibly impressive and humble individual. Yeah, so, the, again, the humility uh, is what you admire. I don't know. I think if you're successful or famous, humility is the key. The moment you start believing your own publicity, the moment you start treating other people like shit, you've lost it as a human being. No? Yes, but it does make more interesting copy. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I would say, you know, before we uh, go over to questions uh, from the house, I would like to thank you, you know, for being very kind to a newbie who's uh, in conversation with you. Thank you. It's been Modesty does not suit you, but try. <laughs> <laughs> but, and also, you know, I, I wish you hadn't been quite so humble because it's more interesting when you're nasty. <laughs> Sorry, I am what I am. Uh, may we uh, open... Op yeah. Manoj, you will have the last question if there is time. <laughs> no, I just, just, just one point, please. If we could just uh, avoid the Indian uh, practice of disguising a speech as a question. <laughs> if you have a question, please ask it within 30 seconds. Ah, Hi. They'll give you a mic, I think. Hi, Mr. Sangvi. Uh, we talked about WhatsApp University. Yeah. I don't know. I'll take 10 seconds. Sure, go ahead. Normally, during the pujas, that's a WhatsApp goes around by your name talking about Calcutta. The puja article. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Was it written by you? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it was. I'll tell you when it was written. We used to have an edition of the Hindustan Times in Calcutta in those days. We had a puja special, and I wrote it for that, for the, for the special issue. That was maybe 20 years back? Do you it right must now? have been, I'm trying to think, it must have been 2002, 2003, yes, 20 years ago. So, do you intend to write one more this year? <laughs> yes, but I think I said it all, and that came out of the experience I'd lived in Calcutta for many years then. It came out of a sense of living in Calcutta. I could write about it as a visitor, but I'm sure Calcutta has changed from what it was then. Absolutely. But the essential element of Calcutta, which I wrote about, the fact that the people are real and that it is warm, I don't think that's changed. So that's what, I'm sorry, uh, we would love to hear, because 20 years Calcutta has changed a lot, we would love to hear your views as a visitor. Thank you. Yeah, okay, I'll try, I'll try and do a new one, but basically I don't think that element has changed. I think there is now yeah, much is. more prosperity in Calcutta than there was in those days. I remember when I came to Calcutta in 1986, I was a non-Bengali and I felt very much like an outsider. I don't any longer to the same extent. I think Calcutta is much more cosmopolitan than it was 25, 26 years ago. But beyond that, I don't think Calcutta has changed that much. I think the people are the same. They don't necessarily show off. They don't drop names. If they say something, they mean it. If you are a friend, they remember you. Uh, I'll take it up during the dinner. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you will all forgive me for butting in again for what? just one. Because you talked about Calcutta and you talked about Durga Puja. Pardon me, that's my hobby horse. Okay. I, uh, I believe in tourism as uh, the future of this state. And I believe in Durga Puja as the biggest tourism property in this country, if not you know, one of the biggest in the world. Yeah. And I'd just like to tell you, I don't know if you've noticed, but there was a study done which showed that the economy around Durga Puja is 
37,500 crore as of 2021. Yeah. So, and it is a huge opportunity. So I dearly request you to write about Pujo again no, and no, again no, and right. again. No, no, just, just one other thing for people who don't know and for you in particular. Yeah. O3 played a stellar role in highlighting the Pujo as a UNESCO heritage event. Oh, really? Yeah. Well done. Congratulations. Uh, now, but it, in fact, it's odd that people outside of Bengal, in the south or whatever, when you try and explain what Pooja is and how big a deal it is in Calcutta, they don't they have no idea. So West Bengal, yeah. So West Bengal hasn't done enough to convey the magic of Pooja. So, you know, since, since I praised him, he'll probably allow me the question. And, and, and this is, uh, uh, and this, is, this, is, this, is, this, is this is to you, this is, this is to you, sir. Uh, sir. Uh, you know, you've been one of India's most prominent journalists who attained yeah. eminence writing at an extremely young age. Yeah. How did it feel, instead of reporting the news or writing, to, uh, writing a column, of becoming the news with the Neera Radia episode? Oh, that felt terrible. That was actually, in many ways, one of the most traumatic experiences of my life, because I tried very hard not to become the news. And while people have had opinions about my journalism and all of that, my integrity or nothing like that had ever been questioned. And I remember when I read the first transcripts, I put a statement out saying that I thought the transcripts had been tampered with. I then waited for the CBI or somebody to come and talk to me. They spoke to various people, but they had no interest in me. And I said, why not? And they said, there's no criminality, nothing in your case. So why are you bothered? People will forget about it. I didn't want to forget about it. I thought it affected me. So I went on my own initiative to five different forensic labs in England and in America. As you know, in these countries, these are labs that are used by the FBI, Scotland Yard. I gave them the so-called tapes. I didn't give them my tapes or whatever. I said, download them from the Outlook site so you'll know what the real tapes are like. They downloaded them. In the case of all of them, they said they had been tampering, and they pointed out where the tampering was, except for one conversation, which they said there was no tampering, but the voice was not mine, which meant that the tape had been so uh, mucked around with that it didn't even sound like me. So I then went back to the police and the CBI, and I said, are you going to say anything? And they said, no, it's nothing to do with us. Then fortunately, the Supreme Court asked them. So the CBI said on three or four different occasions, the Supreme Court, and this is on record, that the tapes have been tampered with. But you know, they were right, because by the time they said the tapes had been tampered with, and by the time I had given Outlook the reports of these labs, people had forgotten about it. But I wasn't going to forget, so I went to Outlook, who had car carried them, and I said, I want you, you made many allegations that I was involved in the 2G scam, etc., on the basis of these tapes. I want you to carry a clarification. They refused. I went to court, which those of you who know Indian courts will know is a thankless task. It took many years, but ultimately the court forced them to issue a clarification. It didn't feel good if that's your question. The lady, the lady there, I guess you raise your hand. Uh, you brought up the subject of a lot of people reading the, you know, the newspapers are still popular. But the nature of newspapers and news itself has changed, right? Which is why we have slanging matches on TV with the anchor not allowing uh, certain views to be placed to the public. Now, till 2014, uh, newspapers were very happy to criticize the government day in, day out. In fact, I was very young. I was still in school when emergency happened. And I remembered newspapers coming out with redacted versions which showed that the government had tried to stop it yeah. and this was an act of defiance. Uh, what happened overnight in 2014 that the majority of news is no longer news, it's not an objective presentation of facts, no criticism, and most news outlets are spokespersons uh, for the ruling dispensation. What was the change? To be fair, it didn't happen overnight. It took a couple of years. It did happen. But I think the broad rule of thumb is 
that anybody who's critical of the government, beyond the point, I mean, there is criticism, but beyond the point, the owner gets a call and usually is told to not, in one case, sack the editor or try and reduce it. In the case of television, it's different. I know this because I have had a television program during the BJP government. The BJP has people who watch news programs and they watch news programs with a calculator. So they will call the editor of the channel afterwards and they will say, today on the news discussion, the BJP spokesman got seven minutes, but the Congress spokesman got 7.8 minutes. Clearly you are biased against us. We will have to do something to you. So that level of scrutiny is bound to have an effect. Then they would get calls saying that the people you, they have to call a Congress spokesman, but the people you've invited apart from the spokesman are people who are hostile to us. Obviously, you are against us. That would cause a certain number of palpitations. Then if you were to interview an opposition person, and even if the anchor was to be as studiously neutral as my anchor was today, and the opposition, <laughs> and the opposition person said something that was critical of the government, they would call and say, you have given a platform to the opposition, you're anti-national. Then, during a debate, if the BJP spokesperson went on and on and on, as if you watch them, you know they do, because when, if frequently when they think they're a losing wicket, they try and sabotage the debate by talking nonsense, and the anchor interrupts that spokesperson, then they call up and complain about the anchor. Then they look at the composition of the panel, which is traditionally one person from each party involved and one or two so-called objective people. They would say that, you know, the so-called objective people have to be guys we send you. So here's a list of people. So somebody who's like an RSS Pracharak will appear on television along with the BJP person, except this person would be described as analyst or commentator or whatever. So therefore, every panel then is now skewered, therefore, towards the government point of view. Despite that, if the argument is not going well for the government, they will do everything possible to sabotage the discussion. There was a time when I started in television, even for panel discussions, you would get people of consequence in the studio. Yeah, if you were, say, talking about, in the Vajpayee government, you would have Arun Jaitley come and sit on a panel or whatever. You did at the beginning of the Modi government. Now they've decided that they'll just send jokers. So almost all the people you see on these shows are people you've never heard of. They're famous only for being on television shows. And they're appointed a spokesperson and sent with a brief saying, say this. And if it isn't working, start a fight, disrupt the show. So that's what's happening to television today. Thank you. You just reminded me of Mohinder Ramanath. Rajan. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hi. So, Finally. Uh -huh. So my question is that for the people in their 20s or teens, what's happening now is the reality. I mean, we can't blame them. Kids yeah. who are 17, 18, 19, my own younger cousins or siblings, who are in their early 20s, probably what they will see is this polarized reality and yeah. the way things are going. Do you think this damage can be undone or is it a permanent damage to this generation, this cohort of teens and early 20s? You That's know, I, 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 I really have no answer to that question. If I'm in a good mood and I want to think of something encouraging, I think of the emergency. Now, the emergency was only two and a half years, but many of us, I think, are young. I was myself was at school, but I remember it quite well. During that period, the average middle-class person you met would tell you what a wonderful woman Mrs. Gandhi was, how they had high hopes of Sanjay Gandhi, how the trains were running on time, how prices had come down, and yeah, what are all this press freedom shit? It doesn't make a difference to me. They would even go so far as when you discussed the mass sterilization program which was going on, they would say, yeah, but these guys breed like rabbits, yeah? Somebody had to do something. I used to wonder then, will those fears, my fear then was, will my fears be realized? Will this become the India of the future? And then we had an election, and it became clear that there was a silent majority that didn't agree with these people. And now we look back at the emergency and we see it as a very unhappy chapter in our history. And yet it's complex because despite the emergency, despite that defeat, in 1980, Mrs. Gandhi was welcomed back by India. By then she was careful not to do anything like the emergency. But 
I find that nations are resilient, that often the damage that is done to them is forgotten. I hope so. Yeah, hi. But I thought it was Mussolini who made the trains run on time. Sorry, what? I thought it was Mussolini who made the trains run on time, famously. Yeah, that was the reference, yes, that was exactly the reference. Hi. What took you so long? I stopped three years ago. <laughs> I think you'll understand the event which yeah. took place. I will yeah. completely stop. Yeah. Newspapers, I sit at two in the morning and I'm very confused. Where do we get our news? What would you recommend? I think there are newspapers still. Many newspapers are still, to be fair, reasonably objective. They're not critical of the government, but they report the news accurately. I was looking at the newspapers in Calcutta today, and while one of them is now longer in news, no longer in newspaper and very sadly is a pamphlet, there are others that were attempting to report the news and try and do the job that a newspaper is supposed to. So it's not completely hopeless. Which you, one? You know, I, I used to work in Calcutta, so I'm not going to take like, any day. I would like you to tell me. <laughs> but I don't think it's entirely hopeless. I think they used to be in the old days. NDT, for instance, was a channel that still had old values, no longer, unfortunately. But it is possible to find out what's happening, even if you won't necessarily get an accurate commentary about it. We really have to look for it. And oh, you do? Yeah, 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 with a fine tooth comb, unfortunately. That's but, why I asked you, where do we go? <laughs> but join the club, I'm as worried as you are. I would submit that the paper you're talking about has a great sports section. Oh, really? The Times of India? <laughs> Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, the current Prime Minister's reluctance to address press conferences or any form of media interaction and his contention that the monkey bath, bath is uh, an adequate representation of what he feels his policy and his thoughts are. I think that's unusual. Most prime ministers answer questions everywhere in the world. But to be fair to him, Manmohan Singh, I think in his 10 years as prime minister, only two proper press conferences. What he would do, and this is being hailed as an example of Manmohan Singh's accessibility, is when he was coming back from a trip abroad, he would hold a press conference on the plane. But I used to be part of those press conferences. The questions were nearly always about the trip. What did George Bush say to you? Did you meet Musharraf? Stuff like that. He was not willing to submit himself to greater scrutiny. During the period when he was prime minister, he never gave interviews. I'm trying to think of a single interview that Manmohan Singh gave. Sonia Gandhi, who had the reputation of being unreachable, gave more interviews than Manmohan Singh. So I agree with you. I think the Prime Minister should give interviews in which the questions are not given to him beforehand and the interview does not conduct the interview in the kneeling position. I would like to see some kind of proper media interaction and I would like to see more press conferences. But let's not be unfair. Manmohan Singh started the trend. Uh, the mic back there, please. Uh, good evening. I wanted to ask you about one thing. You have been pretty critical about the present generation and the social media. But isn't it right that the internet and social media has actually opened up the mind and opened up uh, the flora to international news and international uh, uh, opinions too. So the uh, present generation, at least what I see about the teenagers I interact with, they are much more informed about what is going on and are much more uh, critical and they know exactly what is going on because they are so exposed to the international media. We are completely forgetting that. Yeah, I mean, I have no problems with what you're saying, ma'am. I started my own website in 2007. I have 4.1 million followers on Twitter. I know, I so I am no enemy of social media. I read the New York Times and the London Times every morning on my phone. The internet has made 
information about the world so the much more media accessible. Actually works for uh, most of the present generation. On the whole, no, because the New York Times and the London Times are internet editions. They're not social media. By social media, I mean things like WhatsApp, Twitter, etc. It would be hard to argue that these are great sources of accurate and fair information. They're not, but they're still the opinions of other people. It's made it very easy for the opinions of uh, international media also to come in the uh, main media. It doesn't necessarily mean the good morning messages and the normal messages. Yes, no, if, if your point is that the internet has opened up the world and we now have access to information and opinions from all over the world, Yes, we have no disagreement on that. No, I just say that, you know, at my age, this is a little dangerous to say, but the social media he's talking about is presumably all the indignant Uncle G's. This is that our Sanskrit is bad. They're not all Uncle G's, yeah? Many of them are young people. Yeah. I'm defensive. Um, yeah. Doc, the mic there, please. For this government, <laughs> well, I frankly believe, and this one I think I'm right about, I think Mr. Modi will come back. I don't think the opposition can get its act together. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask, on the other end of the spectrum from yeah. social media, the Bharat Jodo Yatra, yeah. what is your sense of what long-term impact it may have long term in the sense 2024, what impact will that have had, given that it's sort of a good cultural fit in how the country thinks and perhaps is going to vote? Well, I think I was very skeptical when he started it, but I think it's worked. At a stroke, it's changed his image. People take him much more seriously than they used to, and that, I think, will make a difference at the next election. He's also, I think, the Congress has struggled for an issue to oppose Mr. Modi on. At the last election, he went with that chokidar chor hai stuff, which didn't work, because nobody understands what the Rafael deal is about. It's not clear that there was that much corruption. And it's certainly not clear that people would believe that Mr. Modi made any money from it. On the whole, even people who don't agree with Mr. Modi's policies do not see him as being personally corrupt which is one reason why the Congress went down to such a terrible defeat last time. This time, by trying to frame the conversation in terms of love versus hate, I think he has a greater chance. I think, and I could complete, I'd be completely wrong, I think most Hindus in this country are not intolerant. I think one reason why democracy has survived in India for so long, it hasn't been most other third world countries, notably Pakistan and Bangladesh, both of which have had problems with democracy, is because it is the nature of Hinduism to be tolerant, to, let live, to live and let live. I believe that when you well, Talibanize Hinduism, when you try and make it an intolerant, fundamentalist kind of religion, up to a point people will take it because it shows a certain amount of Hindu pride. But no Hindu wants riots, no Hindu wants to see somebody's homes being bulldozed. Ultimately, people do want love. There may be spells of hate, but you can't live your life full of hatred. So I think if the Congress plays its cards right, there's a platform there. Thank you very much. Very happy. Mr. Ghosh. Mr. Sangvi. Yes. Uh, thanks for being in the Bengal Club in Calcutta. It's Thank you. Great uh, listening to you. I just want to you know, have a throwback on what you said just now, that you had interviewed Manmohan Singh on the way back on the flight, right? That's what you said. I or, said that when Manmohan Singh gave press conferences, he, they, he tended, to, they tended to be press conferences on the flight. And now right. they're adding all those up and right. saying Manmohan Singh so, gave 20 uh, or whatever. What, what Mr. Modi has done, he has done away with this. He yeah. travels very light. He doesn't care, carry a retinue of, you know, uh, liberal Median, yeah. and, uh, you know, uh, reporters or journalists. So, he, for, as a matter of record, he doesn't carry Chaddiwala journalists either. It's right, not just yeah, liberal no, journalists, yeah? Right. Okay. So, does it, you know, and actually influence you how you know, how you actually analyze him, you know, when you, because he's taking away certain privileges? 
No, I don't think it's a great privilege to travel on Prime Minister's plane. If you, if you, no, have you ever traveled on the Prime Minister's plane? No, I know. Okay, let me. Okay, let me tell you what it's like. You okay. end up at the airport several hours before the Prime Minister does. Your luggage is taken away for you. You are herded into the back of the aircraft. You sit there with your nose pressed against the glass of the window, waiting for the Prime Minister to drive up. He drives up just before takeoff. He goes into the cabin. You then sit there in silence while the plane takes off. The plane lands. The Prime Minister gets off, speeds off in a limo. You are then taken to a vacant area. You hang around waiting for a bus to take you to the hotel. The Prime Minister goes to a very nice hotel. You are taken to some crap hotel which they charge you for. You sit in that hotel. You get no special access to the Prime Minister. That's why it's such a big deal if he comes back on his way for, back from the trip and does a little press conference. It's not, as Mr. Modi's friends tend to suggest, that the Prime Minister puts his arms around us and we all go on drinking. Okay. I've done it often enough and frankly I did a column when he ended it saying, thank God he stopped taking journalists. Only because you don't know what it's like do you think it's a privilege. Great. You know, I had been in the same lift as Hamid Karzai when he was on the first, you know, hit list. So I was actually held by the Afghan security forces, pinned against the wall, and I had to come down that that's, hotel. That's very unusual. So it, it is, they must have thought like, you were a suspicious guy or yeah, something. Th that's right. You know, I just entered. <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, do we really have more uh, time for more questions? It's, it, the Bengal Club is usually very uh, particular about meal times. And I, uh, I won't take long. Uh, talking about 2024, uh, leaving aside the religious aberrations that we integ integrally have in politics, don't you think uh, development and economic well-being is also going to be a major agenda here? We don't know is the honest answer. Let's go back to the Vajpayee government. If you remember in the last, years of the Vaj last year of the Vajpayee government, they believed they'd done very well. There was a lot of middle-class euphoria. Mr. Advani launched a campaign called Mera Bharat Mahan. Now I suppose they'll call it, uh, sorry, no, that was Rajiv Gandhi. He launched one called India Shining. Yeah? I suppose now they'll call him anti-national for saying India. But certainly that was the slogan. And everybody believed, including Mr. Vajpayee, because they advanced the election that he was going to win. The Congress was written off as a joke. And what happened? The BJP lost the Congress once. So elections are capable of throwing up surprises. It could be that the issues you mentioned, development, economics, which really do matter and are crucial to the future of this country, are just not being talked about in this noise about whether it should be called Bharat, should be called India, and all these made up issues that they have. Maybe people do believe them, believe that they are important, and maybe the elections will throw up a surprise. I don't even know if the religious aberrations are a part of it. I mean, I think the religious stuff provokes a certain amount of hysteria, but people who say that Mr. Modi wins elections only because he provokes hatred against Muslims are wrong. Mr. Modi is actually very popular in his own right. People believe that he's a very good prime minister, that the country is doing better under him. Now, whether they believe that enough to vote for him again, whether they'll ignore the reality of inflation, what's happening, I don't know. Thank you very much. I would have handed it over to Orunabhu uh, to close the proceedings, except that Orunabhu has a question. Yeah, hi. Sh short, short question. You spoke of people you've been impressed by in public life and in politics. Yeah. But who have been your heroes in journalism? And if you can give us a few names and why. I actually am not a guy with heroes. I never actually look up to individuals. I think as journalists, you're trained on the whole to look for feet of clay. There are many people in my career who I have been impressed by, not necessarily journalists. I was very impressed by Arun Shuri. I think he changed the form of Indian journalism, what he did, the kind of investigative journalism I think he did. I owe a great deal and I have learned a great deal from Avik Sarkar who employed me and brought me to Calcutta in 1986. Almost everything I've learned about keeping your cool, managing people, giving people the right to say what they want, even if it seems insolent, 
even if you disagree with them. I think I've learned from Avik. So Avik would certainly be one of my heroes in journalism. I'm trying to think. Can't think very well. Yeah, thanks. What about publications? Not individual books, but publications that you hold in India? In India, none. Abroad, many. Yeah. I think the BBC, for instance, has done a terrific job. It's faced all kinds of pressures from the government, and it's dependent on the government for its funding. The director general has been forced out, and this has happened with conservative and labor governments. I have huge admiration for the way it's held on to the principles. I used to, though, it now seems irrelevant. I had huge admiration for Time magazine, for the way in which it took news from all over the world and managed to produce it in an easily digestible platform. It was also, I thought, important from a technical point of view. The line was that if you ever wrote a line twice, read a line twice in Time magazine, then the magazine had failed because the writing had to be that smooth. And I've written for time, I've done columns for time, and I realized how that happened because if I'd written what I thought was a really cool sentence, I would get a call first from the person editing my copy and then all the way to the editor-in-chief of time discussing that sentence and saying, what can we do to change it? It's just the level of detail that went to time in its heyday I found was very impressive. The New York Times, I think, is easily the best newspaper in the world. I've always been impressed by its commitment to detail, its commitment to accuracy, and more than that, by the breadth of its coverage. We talk about the New York Times as a great political newspaper, but the influence it has, if the New York Times critic gives a play a bad review, it closes the following week. If the New York Times restaurant critic doesn't like a restaurant, the chances are it won't work. So to be able to have that kind of power and to use it responsibly, I think is worth admiring. Where do you place Wire? How many questions are you? You can have a one-on-one. -on -one. I, th I, think, I think the Wire has done a very important job in that it has shown it has courage, and therefore it has carried many stories that other people would not carry. It has also, it must be said, often taken a one-sided point of view, and it has often got stories wrong like the recent story about Abid Malavia. So no, it's not untrammeled admiration. So my third attempt at giving a vote of thanks. I think I'll succeed this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Sangvi. It's uh, enlightening and entertaining in equal measure always to hear you. Thank you, Mr. Bhattacharya, for carrying the proceedings with such, such grace. And thank you very much to The Telegraph for sponsoring the, <laughs> the, the event. And for, for their constant support. And Are they really us, sponsoring this? Yes, it's an association. With Who's Telegraph. here from the Telegraph? Well, we have uh, the sports editor and we have the chief financial officer somewhere. So, but both of them are here <laughs> as members of the club to, to, okay. to hear you right. talk. Great. Hi, guys. I meant the Times of India, okay? Just sort of <laughs> <laughs> and a very special thank you to Mrs. Malavika Banerjee of our entertainment subcommittee for making this happen. Thank you, as always, to the staff and executives of the Bengal Club, and particularly to Shoni Bhushan for taking the mics around so diligently. Before we close, may I ask Mrs. Kasturi Khaitan to hand over the flower bouquets to the guests, please. And may I request Mrs. Srila Mukherjee to hand over the gifts, please. Thank you, Dr. We wish we had more time, but we are constrained by dinner. So we'll see you upstairs. Thank you. <laughs>